thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I thank the organizers of this uh, conference for uh, inviting me to speak. It's an honor uh, to come here um, to this university. It's long been a uh, beacon of uh, Catholic or orthodoxy and a model of what Catholic higher education should and can be. Uh, I'd had no idea uh, when I prepared my talk what Mike would talk about, so this is my talk is truly uncorrelated with his talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> any, any, um, any connection between anything I say and anything he said is purely a matter of chance. Because, um, now, the title of this symposium was in the form of a question. By the way, is this OK? It, 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 the title of the symposium is in the form of a question. Can science inform our understanding of God? If the question is whether science can directly tell us anything about the divine nature, then of course the answer is no. Natural science studies the natural world, and God is not a part of the natural world. On the other hand, the things that science can tell us are not without relevance to theology for several reasons. One reason is that our theological ideas are shaped, often unconsciously, by non-theological ideas and assumptions, as has been emphasized by the Polish philosopher, physicist, and priest Michael Heller. It's natural for people in every age to form a world picture by integrating what they have learned from various sources, including revealed truth, common knowledge, common sense, prevailing scientific ideas, and philosophical speculation. Our world picture conditions how we think, the kinds of concepts and images we form, and what is regarded by us as reasonable or plausible, both on theological and on non-theological subjects. But world pictures change over time, and what seemed perfectly plausible at one time may seem quaint or absurd at another. A simple example that illustrates this is the question of the location of hell. Considering this pass consider this passage from the article on hell in the Catholic Encyclopedia, written in 1910. Quote, as to its locality, all kinds of conjectures have been made. It has been suggested that hell is situated on some far island of the sea or at the two poles of the earth. Swindon, an Englishman of the 18th century, fancied it was in the sun. Some assigned it to the moon, others to Mars. Others placed it beyond the confines of the universe. The Bible seems to indicate that hell is within the earth, for it describes hell as an abyss to which the wicked descend. We even read of the earth opening and of the wicked sinking down into hell. And it cites some scriptural passages. Is this merely a metaphor to illustrate the state of separation from God? Although God is om omnipresent, he is said to dwell in heaven because the light and grandeur of the stars and the firmament are the brightest manifestations of his infinite splendor. But the damned are utterly estranged from God. Hence, their abode is said to be as remote as possible from his dwelling, far from heaven above and its light, and consequently hidden away in the dark ab abysses of the earth. However, no cogent reason has been advanced for accepting a metaphorical interpretation in preference to the most natural meaning of the words of scripture. Hence, theologians generally accept the opinion that hell is really within the earth. The church has decided nothing on this subject. Hence, we may say that hell is a definite place, but where it is, we do not know." Uh, unquote. Now, why did Catholic theologians for so long quote, generally accept the opinion that hell is within the earth, unquote. It was not because of some general commitment to biblical literalism, nor was there any authoritative magisterial teaching on the question. Most likely, the reason had to do with what seemed plausible within the context of their world picture. Some of the biblical imagery of lakes of fire and sulfurous pits was presumably inspired in the first place by volcanoes and their attendant phenomena. And at later times, these phenomena would have served to make a literal interpretation more credible, as would widespread notions about the netherworld as the abode of the dead. But our world picture has changed. 
in particular, science has learned what the interior of the Earth is like, and that the Earth will eventually be obliterated when the sun explodes and becomes a red giant. Very few, if any, Catholic theologians today would take seriously the idea that hell is inside the Earth. The point is that prevailing ideas about the structure of the physical world and its history have always influenced theological reflection, opinion, and speculation. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The theology attempts to render the truths of faith intelligible and plausible in the context of the knowledge of the day. Nevertheless, there's an obvious danger of the faith becoming adulterated. This can happen in two opposite ways. One is that theology becomes wedded to scientific ideas of an earlier era that turn out to be false, as happened in the Galileo case. The other is that in attempting to stay up to date, theologians chase after new ideas in science without recognizing how speculative and ephemeral these sometimes are. There is no simple formula for steering a middle course. Discernment is required, and that in turn requires a certain level of scientific judgment and knowledge. I did not choose the example of the location of hell at random. One's understanding of, esch of eschatological realities will tend to be particularly affected by one's world picture. How, for instance, are the clouds of heaven on which the Lord will return to be understood? Or St. Paul's statement that those who are still alive at the Perusia will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord, quote, in the air. <coughs> A question that has been speculated about since the time of the apostles is what our resurrected bodies will be like. A traditional opinion is that our bodies will be similar in structure and composition to those we now have, but perfected and freed from some physical limitations. This view is highly problematic, however, from the viewpoint of any world picture that incorporates our modern understanding of matter. Bodies made up of the same kinds of matter would have to be subject to very similar physical laws, and that would inevitably entail the corruptibility of those bodies because of fundamental physical considerations having to do with entropy. One theologian who was, was aware of this problem was Joseph Ratzinger, who argued in his Introduction to Christianity that the resurrection cannot simply be, quote, the return of the fleshly body, that is, of the biological structure, unquote, as that would necessarily mean a perishable body, and, quote, the perishable cannot become imperishable, unquote. He noted that St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 was, quote, far less naive than later theological erudition with its subtle constructions on the question how there can be eternal physical bodies, unquote. A second reason that science is relevant to theology is that theology cannot do without philosophy. And philosophy is always in conversation with science. It certainly was in the Middle Ages. Aristotelian philosophy gained prestige and a large following in the Middle Ages, even at a time when it was still theologically suspect, in large part because it was thought to give a correct account of natural phenomena. Indeed, long after the Middle Ages, we find Thomistic philosophers passing judgment on scientific theories. In the 17th century, for instance, many of them reacted quite negatively to the idea that matter is made up of atoms and to ideas about vacuums and air pressure that turned out to be correct. So while theology, philosophy, and natural science are distinct disciplines with their own sources, methods, and competences, they inevitably influence each other. A contemporary example of this relates again to our resurrected bodies. It is de fide Catholic teaching that we shall have the same bodies that we now have in some sense that hasn't been defined. In contemporary philosophy, there's much discussion of what makes something the same thing through time. One school of thought holds that there needs to be some degree of material continuity at the level of the elementary constituents of the things, which we may suppose to be particles. And this continuity is held by some to require not just particles of the same type, but some at least of the very same particles. 
However, this runs up against a basic fact about matter discovered in the 20th century, which is that elementary particles have no individuality, or what medieval philosophers called hykeitas, thisness. Given a set of electrons, for example, there's no meaning to saying which electron is which. For example, asking whether the electron over here now is the same one as the electron over there later. So we see here a case where a fact of physics has relevance to an issue in philosophy, the identity of things through time, which in turn has relevance to a theological question, in what sense our resurrected bodies will be the same. Now, the rest of my talk will be about a subject where theology, philosophy, and science quite clearly intersect, and that is the nature of time. It's, it is obvious that science has something to say about this question. Two of the major breakthroughs of, the 20, of 20th century physics, Einstein's theory of special relativity and general relativity, gave us a much deeper understanding of time. It's also clear that the nature of time is an important subject for theologians, as can be seen from the fact that St. Augustine devoted Book 11 of his Confessions to a famous analysis of it. Let's begin with that analysis. Virtually all of the ancient pagan philosophers, including Aristotle, believed that the universe had always existed. And it seems that some pagans were given to mocking the Jewish and Christian belief that the universe had a beginning. They would ask what the God of the Bible was doing for the infinite time before he got around to creating the world. To this, St. Augustine gave a profound answer. He started with the fact that time is a feature of the created world and is therefore itself something created. As he put it, there can be no time without creation. What times could there be that are not made by you, O Lord? But if time is something created, then the beginning of created things must also be the beginning of time. It is self-contradictory, therefore, to speak of a time before creation. To quote St. Augustine once again, you, O Lord, made that very time, and no time could pass by before you made those times. But if there was no time before heaven and earth, why do they ask what you did then? There was no then where there was no time. The brilliance of this insight is staggering. It was 16 centuries ahead of its time. Not until Einstein's theory of general relativity, which was proposed in 1916, did science catch up to it. St. Augustine started with the fact that time is something created. Modern physics starts with the fact that time is something physical. This fact was not apparent before general relativity. Up to that point, space and time tended to be thought of by scientists as a kind of mathematical backdrop to physical events. Physical events and processes unfolded in space and time, but space and time themselves took no part in events and underwent no processes. With general relativity, however, it became clear that space-time is a fabric that bends, flexes, stretches, and ripples in response to the energy and momentum of the matter that fills it. Indeed, these movements of, of the space-time manifold themselves carry energy and momentum. Space-time, in short, is no less physical than atoms or magnetic fields or rocks or trees. It necessarily follows that if there was a beginning to the physical universe, it was also the beginning of space and time. It therefore makes no sense to speak of a time before the universe began. St. Augustine's great insight has triumphed. Notice that what had seemed a formidable theological problem, what was God doing before he made the universe, was shown to be a pseudo-problem by St. Augustine's philosophical analysis, which was later confirmed or seconded by the insights of modern theoretical physics. St. Augustine's understanding of time has further consequences. It implies that God is outside of time, Past, future, before, and after refer to relationships among created things. 
and therefore do not apply to God at all. God may cause physical event A to happen before physical event B, but God's willing of A does not happen before his willing of B, nor does God's knowing of A happen before his knowing of B. God knows and wills a world in which things happen in temporal succession, but his knowing and willing do not happen in temporal succession. God is atemporal. He dwells, as St. Augustine put it, in the sublimity of an ever-present eternity, or in St. Thomas's words, in the nunc stans, the now that stands still. God, one might say, is the still I at the center of the storm of being. In the 20th century, various theological movements posited temporality in the Godhead. These include process theology, kenosis theology, and open theism. These movements, though mainly Protestant in origin, have had some influence in Catholic, th Catholic circles. Process theology seems to have been inspired by the facts of biological evolution and cosmic evolution. The idea is that the evolving universe is ever open to novelty in the sense of developments that could not have been foreseen. The world is an ongoing creative process and God is seen, at least by some of these theologians, not as the creator of the universe so much as the imminent creativity of the universe. In their eyes, this allows the universe, and especially human beings, to have more autonomy and gen genuine freedom than if God foreknew and forewilled events in accordance with an eternal plan. This is a major concern also of the open theists who believe that human freedom is incompatible with divine foreknowledge. God must, therefore, they think, be ignorant of the future, either because the future does not exist to be known or because he chooses not to know it. Kenosis theology, kenosis means emptying, takes its point of departure from Philippians 2.7, which speaks of Christ emptying himself and taking the form of a slave. There are many strains of kenosis theology, but the more radical ones suggest that the Son, the Son of God, divested himself of divinity for a period of time. He did not merely assume a human nature, but shed his divine nature, or at least some of the attributes of divinity. They think it necessary that the Son be able to suffer for our redemption, not only in his human nature, but in his divine nature as well. Some of the advocates of process theology, open theism, and kenosis theology also imagine that by rejecting traditional beliefs about God's omniscience and omnipotence, they can resolve or lessen the problems of theodicy. God is less liable to blame for the evil and suffering in the world, they think, if he is less in control. Whatever else may be said about these theological movements, it's clear that insofar as they deny the immutability, impassibility, omniscience, and omnipotence of God, they, saw, they contradict uh, dogmas of the faith. They are incompatible with the Catholic faith. For faith, that is all that needs to be said. But faith seeks understanding, and so it is the task of reason, enlightened by faith, to show how these erroneous opinions fail to accord with the whole structure and pattern of revealed truth and with sound philosophy. This theological and philosophical task I do not propose to undertake here. Rather, since this talk is about the relation of science to our understanding of God, I wish to make a different point, namely that these theological innovations are not only heterodox, but are also deeply problematic from the perspective of what we have learned about the nature of time from modern physics. Let us consider the statement made by many open theists, process theologians, and kenosis theologians that, quote, God does not know the future, unquote. What's problematic about this statement for the orthodox theologian is its concept of God and divine knowledge. What would be problematic for the modern physicist, however, is its concept of the future, its concept of the future. The physicist has no trouble understanding what future means. But he, does, but he has a great deal of trouble with the idea of the future. 
So let us take a closer look at the concepts of future and past. Our experience of time begins with our own stream of consciousness, which has a simple linear ordering of past, present, and future. The past is what we remember, and the future is what we anticipate. To quote St. Augustine's Confessions, the past is present memory, the future is present anticipation. Let us call this psychological time. When we turn to the physical world, we find that it has a causal structure. And it is this causal structure that gives a temporal ordering to events. From a phys physics point of view, event B is in the future of event A, if and only if A can physically influence B. Let's call this ordering physical time. Clearly, human psychological time and physical time are connected. We are embodied beings. And as St. Thomas Aquinas noted, whatever exists in our intellects must first exist in our senses. You can only acquire natural knowledge about physical events if they've had an effect upon your sense organs through some chain of physical causation. Consequently, only events that are in your physical past can be naturally known to you, exist in your memory, and thus be in your psychological past. Similarly, your will can only produce outward effects through physical motions of parts of your body, so that what you anticipate doing or intend to do, which belongs to your psychological future, must also lie in your physical future. Given the close connection between our psychological time and physical time, it's quite natural to assume that the physical universe has the same simple linear past, present, future ordering that we experience in our mental life. And indeed, this was the assumption made in Newtonian physics. Einstein's theory of special relativity, however, showed that this is wrong. The causal structure, and hence the temporal structure, of the physical universe is more subtle. It consists not of a one-dimensional chain, but a four-dimensional web of causal relationships. In Newtonian physics, it makes sense to speak of a set of events extending throughout all of space as being simultaneous. That is, as all happening now, with respect to each other. Such a universally defined now, or present moment, is a slice that divides the universe into the past and the future with respect to that moment. Any event that is happening now, anywhere in the universe, can physically influence any event that is in the future anywhere. Similarly, any event in the past, anywhere, can physically influence any event that is happening now, anywhere. That is, in Newtonian physics, one has a universal definition of past, present, and future with respect to any moment. Special relativity has shown, however, that this is not the way the universe works. The reason is that physical influences cannot propagate faster than a certain fundamental speed called C, or the speed of light in vacuum. Because of this, if an event B lies in the physical future of event, an event B lies in the physical future of event A, if and only if influence could travel from A to B going at or slower than the speed of light, that is, in the physics jargon, the future of event A consists of all events that lie within or on the future light cone of A. Similarly, the events that lie in the physical past of event A are those from which influence traveling at the speed of light or slower would be able to reach event A. In the jargon, those that lie within or on the past light cone of A. What this means is that there's a third class of events, namely those that are too far away from event A, either to physically influence it or be influenced by it. These events lie neither in the past nor in the future of A. 
but are said to have a space-like separation from A. Note that one is no longer speaking about the past and the future in a universal sense, but about the past and future of particular events. The past of event A, for example, or the future of event A. And as far as the present goes, one no longer speaks about it at all, since according to relativity, no two events in the universe are simultaneous with each other in any absolute sense. The reason that there is no such thing as simply the future, unanchored to particular events, is that relativity tells us no two events have the same futures or pasts. That is, given two events, x and y, there will always be some events that are in the future of x, but not of y, and others that are in the future of y, but not of x. To sum up, in Newtonian physics, one only had two regions, past and future, divided by a slice called the present. In relativity, however, each event has three regions of space-time associated with it, past, present, and space-like separated, which are divided from each other by two slices, called the past light cone and the future light cone. The technical details do not matter for the purposes of the present discussion. What does matter is that such a dividing up of space-time can only be done with respect to some specific event. Given some event A that happens at some particular time and place, one can talk about events that lie in its future or in its past. For example, it's perfectly meaningful for me to speak of something happening in my future. If I say, B will happen in the future, what I'm really saying is that B lies in the future of this utterance, which is being made here and now. That is, an event located at a specific time and place. On the other hand, it does not make sense to speak about God's future unless God is localized in space. Another way to understand this is that relativity ties time and space together in a way that wasn't true in Newtonian physics, which is why one speaks of space-time. To make God dwell in time, therefore, is also to make him dwell in space. Newtonian physics made a naive mistake in projecting onto the physical universe temporal concepts based on our own psychological time. In most practical situations, this mistake makes no difference. One can ask without any, any significant ambiguity what people are doing now in the next room. It only takes light a few nanoseconds to propagate to the next room. So the ambiguity in the concept now is negligible. And it should be emphasized that the Newtonian mistake was not harmful for physics, but on the contrary, Newtonian concepts were a necessary stage in the progress of physics. If it was a naive mistake to project our one-dimensional psychological time onto the four-dimensional physical universe, how much more naive is it to project it onto God himself, as those do who say that God does not know the future? I should note that there's one theologian who argues that God does not know the future and who cannot be accused of naivete about physics, and that's John Pokinghorn. Pokinghorn is a theoretical particle physicist, as I am. He knows very well what special and general relativity say about the nature of time and is well aware of the problem that they pose from in making sense of the notion of the future. He proposed a technical answer in his book Science and the Trinity. He noted there that if, the, that if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, to use the technical jargon, there is a natural way to define a cosmic time or age of the universe. This cosmic time is defined as the time that has elapsed since the Big Bang as measured in the reference frame in which the radiation filling the universe is at rest. Pokinghorn suggests that this cosmic time could be used to define the future of which God is supposedly ignorant. At any cosmic time, Pokinghorn suggests, God might, only, might know only the events that happen at, 
at that cosmic time were earlier, but not events that happened later in cosmic time. It's true that a cosmic time can be defined in a reasonably but not entirely unambiguous way for the part of the universe that we can see. There are strong reasons to suspect, however, that on larger scales of distance, the universe is not homogeneous and isotropic, in which case cosmic time becomes an ill-defined concept. But aside from this technical objection, I think Pokinghorn is losing sight of the basic lesson that the physics is teaching us. To reiterate the crucial point, physical time is rooted in physical causality. Event A is physically prior to event B, if and only if it can physically influence B. Thus, thus, it is really only sensible to apply the categories of physical time to entities that are involved in physical cause and effect. We human beings are physical as well as spiritual, and so we are subject to physical time. Even our intellects, though not physical, are tied, at least in this life, to the space and time of this universe because we acquire knowledge through our physical senses. God's knowledge, however, is not of this sort. Pokinghorn himself would reject the notion that God makes use of physical processes to learn about what is going on in the world. God's mind is therefore not subject to physical time as our minds are. It is true that the Son of God assumed a human nature and so in his human nature was subject to physical time, but no one has ever denied this. I should emphasize that physics cannot prove that open theism is wrong or that God is immutable. Pokinghorn's version of open theism, for example, is not logically inconsistent with physics. Nor does Catholic theology need to make use of physics to show that open theism is wrong. Nevertheless, what physics teaches us about time casts a helpful light on the issue. Anything that gives us a deeper understanding of time is surely relevant to the question of God's relation to time. So far, I've been talking about open theism, process theology, and kenosis theology, which are admittedly somewhat esoteric ideas chiefly popular among non-Catholic academic theologians. So why does any of this matter? If the kinds of errors I've been discussing were confined to those narrow circles, they would not matter very much, to be sure. But I think that similar confusion about God's relation to time are very widespread and contribute a great deal to popular and even scholarly confusion about the relation between science and religion and to the perception that they are at odds with each other, or at least in tension. time-bound creatures that we are, it is impossible for us to imagine eternity and very difficult to think about it clearly. Almost inevitably, we tend to imagine God as a temporal being. But in thinking of him this way, we unwittingly drag him down to the level of a creature, and not just a creature, but a physical creature. He becomes in our thought just one thing among things in our universe, one physical cause among other physical causes. One can see symptoms of this thinking in many places. One symptom is the tendency of people to think of God's role in creation as that of some physical force that acted 14 billion years ago, or more recently for biblical literalists. Many times I've been asked by religious people, what caused the universe to start expanding in the first place? I think that in many cases they expect to hear or hope to hear that it is beyond the possibility of scientific explanation because they think this would create a job opening for God to act as the force that started things off, as though he were the explosive that produced the Big Bang or the match that lit it. Atheists, too, think this way, including Hawking, who has recently suggested that certain speculative ideas in cosmology show that, quote, it is not necessary to invoke God to light 
the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Another symptom is the notion held by most atheists and many Christians that God, as an explanation of things, is in competition with natural explanations, as so that the more science explains, the less there is for God to do. Several years ago, in an article in the journal First Things, I asked why the evolution of species should be a disturbing thought to Christians, since, quote, if one is happy with natural explanations of the formation of stars and planetary systems, why not of plants and animals? This provoked an angry letter from a well-known evangelical Protestant gentleman who asked, quote, is it possible that a man of Barr's education really wonders why some of us would not accept a natural explanation for the formation of stars and planets in light of discoveries made by the Hubble telescope, made possible by the Hubble Tebble telescope? A Big Bang presupposes a force that brought all this into being, that is God. People who believe there is a natural explanation for the formation of stars, the planetary systems, plants, and animals are by any definition naturalists. Neo-Darwinists have made it clear that they presuppose a natural beginning of the universe, that is, no God. We see here again the idea that God is a force needed to set off the Big Bang. But we also see the idea that natural explanations mean no God. It may seem strange that someone who sees in natural explanations a threat to God's role in the world would use such naturalistic language of God, a force. But actually, the two ideas are logically linked. It is precisely to the extent that God is seen as being like a natural force himself, that he is seen as competing with other ordinary natural forces. They have been put on the same playing field. A third ex symptom is the idea that if there is chance or randomness or accident in nature, then God is not in control or doesn't know where things are headed. A related idea is that if one attributes blindness or aimlessness to natural processes, one is necessarily denying God. The point is that if God is being thought of as though he were another part of nature, then saying that nature is stumbling along blindly, as it were, is tantamount to saying that God is too. I think this is what may underlie some of the opposition aroused by the idea that random genetic mutations drive evolution. The disease underlying all these symptoms, I believe, is an inadequate idea of how God relates to time, which leads to an inadequate theology of creation and of divine action in the world. The cure is to go back to the profound insight of St. Augustine. To see how these issues are all related, it's helpful to use an old analogy that compares God to the author, as the author of the universe to a human author of a book. Let's consider then a novel. The events in a novel are causally related to each other. This causal structure gives the novel an internal time, which we may call plot time. For simplicity, let us suppose that the not that the story unfolds in a simple sequence, no flashbacks, for example, so that events that occur on one page only affect events on later pages or later on the same page. This allows us to measure the plot time by page and line. Plot time starts on the first page of the text and ends on the last page both past and future are finite in extent. Note that the doings of the author, his getting married or deciding what to have for dinner, are not events of the novel's plot, assuming it is not an autobiographical novel, and thus have no page and line number. 
They are completely outside of the novel's plot time. This is true even of the author's activities related to the writing of the book. The author's deciding to write the book, outlining the plot, inventing characters, composing dialogue, are not themselves events in the plot of the novel and have no plot time. Even though they do determine what events happen in the novel and when in plot time they happen. At this point, one sees that two levels of causality are involved in the novel. There is the causality whereby one event in the novel causes another event in the novel, which we could call horizontal causality. And there is the causality whereby the author conceives of the novel and brings it into being as a work of art, which does not take place in plot time. One could call this vertical causality. These two kinds of causality are obviously not in competition. For example, in talking about the novel Crime and Punishment, it is silly to ask the question, whether the old pawnbroker woman died because Raskolnikov struck her with an ax or because Dostoevsky wrote the book that way? <laughs> the answer is both. Raskolnikov's murderous act is the cause within the novel of the pawnbroker's death, while Dostoevsky is the cause of the novel and of all its plot including the death of the pawnbroker. The analogy of the universe and its creator to a novel and its author is obviously not perfect. No analogies are. But it does illuminate some key insights of St. Augustine. First, we see that time is something created. The author of the novel is the one who gave its plot whatever internal causal and temporal structure it has. He could have written a book with no internal causality or time, that is, just disjointed and chaotic events. Or he could have had the plot time go around in a circle, or equivalently repeat endlessly. Or he could have devised very intricate causal and temporal structures, as in some science fiction books involving time travel. Second, we see that the author of the universe is outside the time of his of the universe. Third, we see that time can have a beginning and an end, as the pages and lines of a book do. And fourth, we see that two non-competing levels of causality, which I have called vertical and horizontal, but, with which, but which, with regard to the universe and God, have traditionally been called primary causality and secondary causality. But the analogy takes us further and allows us to understand how time relates to creation. The creation of the book is not the same thing as the beginning of the book in the sense of its first words or the first events of its plot. That is confusing the two levels of causality. The first events in the novel's plot are causes within the novel of later events in the plot but they do not cause the novel itself. That, <clears throat> that is, they do not explain why there's a novel. The cause of the novel is its author. It would be silly, for example, if someone asked you why there is such a book as A Tale of Two Cities, to point to the words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That doesn't explain why there's the novel. Those are simply the first words of the novel. In the same way, the temporal beginning of the universe, whether it was the Big Bang, as in the standard cosmological model, or some other event, is not the same thing as the cause of the universe. But <clears throat> by the same token, creation is not just something that happened at the temporal beginning of the universe. God equally creates all times, places, and events in the universe, just as the author of a novel is equally the author of every word of it. The last word as much as the first. 
In theology, there is a distinction made between God's creating at the beginning of time and his conservation of the universe in being. But St. Thomas and other scholastic theologians taught that this distinction is only notional. There is no real distinction between God's act of creating and conserving. They are one timeless act. From the fact that there are two levels of causality, one sees that thinking of God as the force that made the universe expand is a simple blunder. Physical forces that push matter around are like the causes that operate within the plot of a book. Creation, on the other hand, is the thinking up of the universe, like the author's thinking up of the whole book, its whole plot, and all the causes that act within it. And there is no reason whatever to think that the beginning of the universe in the sense of its opening events, must have violated the laws of physics, any more than the first sentence of a novel should violate the rules of good grammar. In that sense, the beginning of the universe may have been a perfectly natural event, natural in the sense that it follows the laws of nature. We also see how absurd it is to imagine that natural causality is in competition with divine causality. It makes no more sense to ask whether horses evolved or were created by God than to ask whether the old pawnbroker was murdered by Raskolnikov or died because that was what Dostoevsky wrote. Of course, it is possible for the author to write events into the plot that are miraculous in the sense that they are exceptions to the rules that govern the internal causality of the rest of the plot. But the author is equally the author of the non-miraculous and the miraculous events. And finally, the idea that randomness and chance in nature mean that God is not in control or doesn't know where things are headed is to confuse the point of view of the characters in the novel with that of its author. The characters may be taken by surprise or be stumbling along in the dark, but the author knows very well what lies in store. As the eminent geneticist Francis S. Collins wrote in his book, The Language of God, quote, but how could God take such chances? If evolution is random, how could he really be in charge? And how could he be certain of an outcome that included intelligent beings at all? The solution is actually readily at hand. Once, we see, when, once one ceases to apply human limitations to God. If God is outside of nature, then he is outside of space and time. In that context, God could, in the moment of the creation of the universe, also know every detail of its history. That could include the formation of the stars, planets, and galaxies, all of the chemistry, physics, geology, and biology that led to the formation of life on Earth and the evolution of humans right up to the moment of your reading this book and beyond. In that context, evolution could appear to us to be driven by chance, but from God's perspective, the outcome would be entirely specified." Unquote. It does not require a knowledge of physics, of course, to understand these things. St. Augustine and St. Thomas understood them long before anything much was known about the laws of nature. But modern physics is actually quite helpful in reinforcing a correct way of thinking about time. The training of those who do fundamental physics makes them more aware than most people that time is merely a feature of our physical universe. That time could have had a different structure. After all, physicists know at least two such structures, Newtonian and Einsteinian. And that there can be realities that lie outside of our time and space. For example, other spatial dimensions of our universe or other universes. The traditional Augustinian conception of time, which is so central to a sound understanding of creation, may come more naturally to the modern physicist, even if he's an atheist, than to the scientific layman, even if he is religious. This is another example of how science can enlarge our imaginations and free us from naive misconceptions about the physical world that can lead theology into errors. This, perhaps this is what Pope John Paul II meant when he said, quote, science 
can purify religion from error and superstition, unquote. Science can play this role by correcting the mistakes of older science that may have distorted the thinking of theologians and philosophers. It is a limited and ancillary role to be sure, but an important one. Thank you. I'm uh, faced with a bit of a dilemma here because uh, in the excellent and very interesting uh, talk that Professor Barr gave, um, I have to respond in 10 minutes to uh, a talk that brought together special and general relativity, a little bit of quantum mechanics, which is a bit easier, uh, comments from the schoolmen and from the church fathers, and various other interesting things. And I have to do this in 10 minutes. Um, so I guess, thank you. Uh, uh, but John, I have to tell you, it's fine, because, because of my verbal uh, inertia, I as a physicist will bend sp space-time, and I will f finish my talk yesterday. <laughs> so, I'm going to take a different tact here, because uh, with the latter half of Professor Barr's presentation, I pretty much agree. I have a little bit more to say, though, on the first half. Um, and it actually was raised by Professor Carroll uh, obliquely, um, and that's the problem of reification. Okay, that's, that is a fairly serious issue that needs to be addressed. Now, let me th I have to set the tone here a little bit from the philosophy of nature. The natural sciences, and I often refer to them as the modern empirical sciences, or you, you'll hear me say MESs are the most fundamental form of knowledge of reality humans have. We are by nature rational animals and we obtain our knowledge through the senses. All human knowledge, with the possible exception of course of mystical knowledge, comes to us through our five external senses. And all the information we obtain through our senses is accessible in some form of empirical observation, followed by measurement, correlation into mathematical formalisms, which then permit us to uh, test hypotheses, make predictions, which makes the natural sciences uh, so strong in what they do. However, while most fundamental, modern empirical scientific knowledge is neither the only form of knowledge nor the most important. And neither are sciences limited to the natural sciences. Metaphysics, philosophy writ large, and theology are fully fledged sciences in their own right. Employing logical terms of art, each science has its own subject matter, or something called a proper object, and material objects. Each has methodologies appropriate to its subject matter, and each demands demonstration to characterize the knowledge obtained as scientific, that is, certain knowledge through causes. A more robust and revealing definition of science is, quote, immediate intellectual knowledge obtained through demonstration. And it's the word immediate here that's important because it characterizes the process by which we humans rise far above the merely sensible knowledge we obtain. We utilize our senses to then reason to higher immaterial verities. In other words, while all knowledge uh, comes through the senses, and Professor Barr alluded to this, not all knowledge is sensory knowledge. To reason well is to reason often and correctly, which means scientific reasoning writ large is an intellectual virtue, in fact. No human is well-formed without developing the virtue of science. I provide my students two examples to help bring this home. The first is the example of stealing candy from a baby. We can, of course, all, when we come on upon the crime scene, we hear the howling of the baby and the screeching of the tire of the getaway car. Okay. We can smell the pungent odor of the candy. We can lick it and taste it if we want. We can touch its tackiness. And we see the hoodlum and the red face of the baby. But what else do we see? We see something called the privation of justice. We've reasoned beyond what is merely accessible to the modern empirical sciences. The second uh, example that I give is I take a survey in my class. I asked the number of students I have, or whatever they are, I asked them, how many of you are budding seismologists or work in seismology? Now, here at this university, of course, that's zero. But in the average kind of 100 collection of people, you would get, may get one or two hands. In California, you may, you may get 15. Okay. <laughs> so very few. I next 
ask them, how many of you have experienced an earthquake? So here at Franciscan, I get about 10 to 12, sometimes 15 hands. I then ask them, how many of you have experienced motion? How many of you know what motion is? They all look at each other quizzically, and all the hands go up. Okay. Now that's an important consideration. The point is that, uh, that motion, meaning local motion, which is a species of change, cannot be reduced to velocity, nor can it be reduced to its mathematical descriptor, the first derivative of position with respect to time. Furthermore, philosophy reflects upon experiences common to all people. The natural sciences have a much more narrow group of people studying quite thin slices of reality. Physicists study material objects and physical phenomena in motion. But philosophers of nature do not have, uh, do, do not have it so easy. They must understand and define motion in its broadest sense as experientially access, uh, accessible to all human beings. Its subject matter is all changeable beings. For example, I can, and am, I can be moved by the beauty of my wife. Now, that is not something that you're going to understand through physics, nor even through biology. Nor is it merely a poetic metaphor. Employing the terms of the natural sciences, I would say I've changed my state. Employing the terms of the philosophy of nature, I potentially used, uh, knew my beautiful wife, but then was reduced to actually knowing her. Without the broader perspective of the philosophy of nature, and I hasten to add, without the support of theological truths expounded in the universities of medieval Western Europe, the narrow work of the natural sciences would indeed be impossible today. The modern empirical sciences rely almost exclusively upon what are called univocal definitions, which, while they may embellish and deepen our understanding of such concepts as time or motion, they cannot possibly topple the broader philosophical understandings of these concepts, nor have they, in contrast to what some people may claim. It is partly for this reason that Newton famously quipped, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. What he was referring to was not the narrow confines of the modern empirical sciences and their discoveries, but natural philosophical reflections upon motion and time as such, including the work of such people as Jean Bourdin, who solved the, uh, who solved the problem of impetus, the first critical step in understanding the modern concept of inertia, fully 350 odd years before Newton, and who is indeed the true initiator of, the modern, cla of, of modern classical physics. While the concept of inertia was alien to Aristotle, who viewed all motion as maintained by an external force, um, rather than the correct understanding of motion as an imminent property of a physical object, Burden's solutions did not topple Aristotle's definition of motion or change, nor his definition of time. Asking what, now getting to Newton, asking what motion is, is not to ask how to measure it. And the same applies to space-time as a mathematically, a very useful mathematical tool. Time is the metric of motion. It is numbered motion. Motion is only possible because material being, uh, things are composites, first of all, of form, which means their actuality, and matter, potentiality. Absolute time of itself, in the sense of existing independently of matter in the universe, makes no sense ontologically. Einstein. A deeply honest man was led to this, that which Aristotle and Aquinas knew long before through his investigations in formulating the special theory of relativity. Now, in terms of the predictive efficacy of the mathematical models employed by both the theories of special relativity and general relativity, there is no problem at all. It's in their job description, so to speak. But a problem does occur when the mathematical models take on lives of their own attempting to directly dictate the ontological status of observed phenomena, the reification problem which uh, Professor Carroll raised, including the grossly incorrect ontological equivocation of matter and energy. It is the tiny little equal sign which wrecks havoc. When employed correctly, it indicates a mathematical relationship, as it should, which is uh, obtained from correlated measurements but it most certainly does not dictate ontological status. Although certainly some insight may be provided into the natures of the objects or phenomena thus related. One cannot credibly claim, quote, 
that space-time is no less physical than rocks or trees, because merely, uh, merely because the accidents of real being, known as position and time, have been mathematically combined into a tensor. If this were true, then any combination of accidents could be considered as its existence on their own right, namely substances. For example, physicists have long combined the three spatial dim dimensions, meaning the metric of position, with time, meaning again the metric of change, into ma to mathematically describe velocity. Does this make velocity a substance? Simply because we can, and we should, we should for the purposes of descriptive and predictive efficacy for physics, does this make velocity of sub uh, substance, uh, make it a substance simply because uh, we, can, we can measure things and we can mathematicize them. Yet this fallacy persists. Okay? The energy momentum tensor used to describe relativistic phenomena is not any closer to being a substance <coughs> simply because the mathematics is more sophisticated. That would be the imperiometric equivalent of cl claiming size matters. Right? I, as a nuclear engineer, at some point had to deal with um, neutron currents, neutron diffusion equations, differential equations that dealt with those, we had to, by necessity, in their full-blown uh, full uh, form, employ seven dimensions. But that in no way suggested that there were seven dimensions. Okay. Special relativity in its purely imperiometric form assigns equal value to all reference frames although we are free to choose a preferred frame without altering the mathematics and hence the predictive efficacy. But here's the problem. If all frames of reference are identical, to conclude that they are really, meaning ontologically equivalent, is absurd. Because, among other things, space and time could be converted into each other merely by moving at a different uniform rate. Time is, again, the metric of motion. Space is the object obtained by leaving behind all accidents except quantity, including the quality of motion. And both of these are useful for developing mathematical models of physical phenomena. But neither space nor time exist without matter. Time and space are completely distinct ontologically, but this should not stop anyone from conceptualizing uh, time and space mathematically for the purposes of doing the good work of special and general relativity. Physicists must, uh, must be cognizant of the fact that space-time is, is not a, quote, no less physical than rocks and magnets, unquote. We can make a concept that we call physical space as long as we physicists ground ourselves in reality by understanding this mathematically based physical space is part of, an, um, uh, part of a theory, a mathematical model, and it is a construct that cannot exist outside the mind. Further, non-Euclidean geometry is not abstracted from the real world because it does not exist in the real world, i.e. outside the mind, in a direct ontological way. Euclidean geometry does exist in the real world, but merely in the sense that it exists in things from which we abstract it. We abstract Euclidean geometry from the physical world and then cobble together the non-Euclidean geometries in order to produce uh, mathematical formalisms that are useful for our work. Take the concrete case of the use of mathematical manifolds in general relativity. A manifold, in fact, is nothing but a mathematical construct that each near point is close to Euclidean geometry. Much of my professional career before coming to teach depended on the conver conversion of matter to energy, understood on a crude level through Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. The equivocation in mathematics is fine because you're dealing with the, re with the uh, relationship of numbers. But the ontological equiv uh, equivocation is a train wreck. The equation does not and cannot dictate that energy is matter. It merely describes a balanced relationship when one ontological entity converts to another. I employ the relationship to determine how many joules of energy I obtain when a certain number of kilograms of matter undergo a substantial change, as opposed to an accidental. Change of a particular, uh, through a particular process that converts matter to energy. But matter and energy cannot uh, uh, be the same thing at the same time in the same manner, period. 
Consider the following absolutely mathematically equivalent expressions for energy. E, and I don't um, wish to remind or create ni nightmares for some of you from your physics uh, before, but E equals one half mv squared, kinetic energy. E equals one half kx squared, spring potential energy. E equals one half cv squared, energy contained in the electrical field of a capacitor. E equals one half li squared, the energy contained in the magnetic field of an inductor. Mathematically, absolutely identical. All of these describe and quantify energy, the quality known as the capacity to do work, of different physical systems. But to suggest that energy is mass, is the spring constant, is capacitance, is inductance, would be problematic. The fact that these expressions are mathematically identical does not in any way imbue mathematics with an ability to impart ontological status. Rather, the mathematics reflects an underlying orderliness of the physical world. It is the orderliness that is fundamentally more important because all the sciences presuppose an orderliness to, the real, to do the real work. It is the orderliness of the teleological character of real beings that Aquinas uses to point to the author of the orderliness of the universe through his fifth way. Orderliness is presupposed by the modern empirical sciences, but the, mere, but the modern empirical sciences cannot explain orderliness in any deep ontological sense. No empirological formalism, no matter its descriptive and predictive efficacy, can actualize reality. No mathematical formalism, quote unquote, governs the behavior of such and such. There is no such thing, apart from possibly in the mind of God, there is no such thing as a quote unquote law of nature, except as a metaphor to help us understand the orderliness of reality manifesting itself how? Manifesting itself through the actualizations of individual natures. A, systemiza a systematization of measurements is not the final explanation one seeks. Now, if you think this is all benign stuff or a tempest in a, teapot, uh, in a teacup for the physicist, listen closely to the following quotations. Consider Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg's description of himself as being, quote, pretty strongly platonic, unquote, saying he thinks the laws of nature are as, quote, real as the rocks in the field, unquote. I would love to see him stub his toe on one of those rocks. Consider Max Tegmark, cosmologist at MIT, speculating that mathematics does not describe the universe. It is the universe, quote, Everything in our world is purely mathematical, including you, unquote. He's been watching too many reruns of The Matrix. <laughs> Consider the irrational, and I mean literally irrational, claim uh, by MIT cosmologist Alan Guth. Quote, the entire universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere, unquote. Do, do you understand how irrational that is? He's not saying that the universe came from God, from the flying spaghetti monster, from a neutrino. He said nothing created it. Consider the scientific philosopher Quentin Smith's assertion, quote, there is sufficient evidence at present to justify the belief that the universe began to exist without being caused to do so, unquote. This year, in a trade journal of physicists, the American Journal of Physics, June 9th, a physicist wrote the following, quote, the most fundamental difference between classical and quantum mechanics is that, and listen very carefully, it's technical, but listen. The difference is, the former makes use of phase space whose individual points represent possible states of a physical system which subsets of points representing physical properties while the latter uses a complex Hilbert space and physical properties corresponding to a subspaces with one-dimensional uh, subspace rays, the quantum uh, analog of a single point in phase space. Yes, that's correct for physics, but note carefully what he just said. He said the so-called, and he uses the terms fundamental difference is tied neither to what classical and quantum mechanics are themselves, nor is it tied to what objects they study. Rather, the quote, fundamental difference is directly tied to the mathematical formalisms employed to describe the behavior of the objects in these two realms. The mathematics is ruling the day. And 
since I'm an equal opportunity gadfly, I'd like to spend a minute on quantum mechanics as well. The so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics states that objects have no properties of themselves, but claims that properties exist only in conjunction with measuring devices and not until measured, in other words, observed. Hence, we have Cornell physicist N. David Merriman's philosophically inept assertion, quote, we now know the moon is demonstrably not there when nobody is looking, unquote. <laughs> This is just another example of permitting an imperiometric theory to bypass sober thinking by assuming it provides direct access to the real. In layman's terms, it confuses the map with the territory. And by the way, here's an interesting note. The role of the Copenhagen interpretation plays in quantum mechanics is similar to the role that Darwinism plays in animating the notion that God does not exist, supposedly because Darwinian theory proper, meaning descent with modification, proves it. Professor Keebler addressed this beautifully, okay? and, I, and I believe Professor Plantinga will, will address this as well. Darwinism tries to unscientifically eliminate God. The Copenhagen interpretation tries to unscientifically eliminate causality. People are more familiar with the philosophical naturalism animating Darwinism. They are much less familiar, because it's further from their typical everyday experiences, with the strange concoction of positivism and neo-Kantianism that animate the Copenhagen interpretation. I can't think of a better way to ruin science than to permit such ideas free reign, to eliminate causality through Copenhagen, and to eliminate universal cause through Darwinism, is to eliminate not just science, fear of exaggeration notwithstanding, it's to eliminate everything. For heaven's sakes, science is knowledge through, wait for it, causes. So, in the end, what does, what does this assistance from the philosophy of nature suggest regarding the questions Professor Barr poses at the beginning of his talk? Namely, how can science affect theology? First, the natural science scientists must acknowledge philosophy and theology are sciences in their own right. Second, while the natural sciences can certainly deepen our insights into the natures of material objects and physical phenomena, it is much less clear that the natural sciences can alter the philosophical fundamentals upon which they themselves depend. Fundamentals worked out long before the so-called scientific revolution. Fundamentals which in fact made the scientific revolution possible. For example, no biological science can directly inform philosophy and theology what a person is, but they can provide deep insights into what human beings are. The biological sciences may be able to tell us that embryonic stem cell research is possible, but whether we ought to do such research, no natural science can dictate. Physics cannot topple the principle of sufficient reason for, if anything else, physics appeals to this principle and others for its work. Physics may provide us very interesting insights. We will have to question how we understand causality, but it can't topple causality because it topples itself. One minute. Our most sophisticated remote sensing technologies may be able to tell us what weapons of mass destruction exist in Iran, but no natural science can tell us, apart from operational considerations, what to do with those weapons. Finally, Realist philosophers should listen and learn from scientists about the, uh, about the real world. St. Thomas would certainly approve and encourage this. The premises of his five ways started in the senses and rose upon both wings of faith and reason to God. St. Thomas, in fact all the schoolmen, would, I fear, be scandalized if theology or, or philosophy students at any university did not take at least one science course or one mathematics course. Christianity, after all, is an integrating and expansive faith, not a territoriality or divide-and-conquer faith. Thank you. <laughs>